welcome to epg patrashala i am dr t s ravishankar director epigraphy retired as i mysore the paper is on indian epigraphy module development of regional languages in indian epigraphy you know as students of ancient indian history and humanities you know how rich indian culture is in fact india is known for its language literature culture heritage and so many things and without proper understanding of the language we cannot really appreciate what real rich heritage we have inherited and nowadays we speak all modern languages like kannada telugu malayalam so many languages have we try to look back and see where the origin lies and this is a very important uh, fact and epigraphy is such a subject it holds before us the origin of many of the dravidian languages not only the languages that are spoken in south india but also the languages that originated in north also which are called indo aryan neo indo aryan languages earlier modules we have tried to understand and appreciate the prakrit language and some of the allied languages that were used in ancient indian epigraphy and we also gave sufficient importance to the sanskrit which dominated the entire epigraphical scene here for many many centuries it was a pan indian languages and um, without proper appreciation of sanskrit we cannot even understand dravidian epigraphy also so all along with other regional languages also which approximately started originating from 5th to 6th century onwards sanskrit also continued to be one of the major important languages and it continued for many many centuries even the medieval late medieval period uh, and it influenced the contemporary literature also kannada telugu tamil they held this way for many many centuries and the contribution of the important dynasties uh, is very much and the rulers patronage and it is for them the language took a very very predominant place and the royal patronage to regional languages is very important and the epigraphical references to various languages is you no know. and as i told india is singularly rich in epigraphs found throughout the indian subcontinent written in varied scripts and languages and uh, it's a very very important to understand when these languages origi- originated and how far we are adopted in our scheme of things when you look at our country from the linguistic point of view perhaps no other country has such diverse and varied languages and scripts and as you know unity in diversity and diversity in unity and sanskrit held though different languages were spoken and sanskrit was one unifying factor which brought our culture in one uh, umbrella for nurturing and patronage various languages in north as well as in south various dynasties that ruled over different parts of india had a very major role to play and the when it comes to early tamil epigraphy the pandyas the pallavas cholas and cheras contributed immensely and uh, coming to tamil records the early pallavas no doubt they had their records written in uh, prakrit but subsequently they shifted to apart from sanskrit they also used started using uh, tamil also the though the early pallavas records especially their charters were written in prakrit later pallavas from 6th century onwards used the tamil and along all along with that they try to use the sanskrit also and the charters of imperial pallavas discovered mainly in the telugu region they started using sanskrit so that the populace which were present and who were there they can understand the uh, the charts or the donation or the gifts made by them uh, to the general public so some of the examples of the pallava rulers we can cite here the kurram plates of parameshwar varman the kasakudi and the tandotam plates of nandivarman second pallava malla and the bahur plates of nrupatunga varman are written in sanskrit and in beautiful tamil languages in grantha tamil characters respectively and uh, you may notice and i would like to uh, refer to this especially to 
write a Sanskrit language, they uh, devised a script called Grantha letters. Because to use the Sanskrit to phonetic value, uh, Grantha was needed. So, uh, Grantha was amply, I mean, abundantly used in um, Tamil records, wherever Sanskrit uh, uh, records or Sanskrit uh, verses had to be uh, cited. The Kuram plates of Parameshwaran first, the Kasakudi and the Thandotam plates of Pallavamalla, the Bahur plates of Nrupatangaruman are written in Sanskrit and Tamil languages, in Grantha and Tamil characters. The earlier Pandya rulers, they wrote their Sanskrit, but unlike the Pallava, Chola grants, Tamil is also written in Vattayirth alphabet instead of Tamil script. We may note that the earlier Pandavas and uh, the Pandyas, they popularized the Vattayirth script. Later Pandya documents such as the copper plate grant of Veera Pandya, dated in Shaka 1392, are however written in Tamil. When we take up a Kannada inscription, I am reminded of one of the very important excavations I attended recently at Talagunda. Apart from many other archaeological uh, facts, um, uh, they discovered a very, very important early Kannada inscription. It's also one of the early inscriptions, though we say Halmidi is one of the earliest. And uh, this uh, inscription recently discovered in Talagunda also is one of the very important inscription, which is almost uh, contemporary to that period. So, Kannada appears in inscription from 6th century AD, an inscription of Chalukya Mangalesha outside the Vaishnava cave at Badami is one of the earliest records in Kannada language. And the Halmidi inscription of about the end of the 6th century is also written in Kannada, while there are there is an endorsement, Kannada endorsement at the end of the Aihala inscription which may be slightly later than the main record. So, apart from that, Kannada inscription, largely the Chalukyas of Badami to write their copper plate grants, they used the Sanskrit profusely, both in official as well as in private records. Among the copper plate grants of the time of the Rashtrakutas, another very important dynasty to reckon with are the Rashtrakutas who held sway over large part of Karnataka and parts of the Deccan and they popularized, apart from Sanskrit, they, we have some Kannada charters also. Among them, the important is the grant belonging from British Museum, which is preserved in the British Museum, is the record of Govinda III. It is written in Kannada language. The Haldipur plates of Pallava chief Gopala, who seems to have flourished in the 8th century, are written in partly Sanskrit and partly in Kannada. And you know, just for the benefit of the local populace, they use the uh, local language so that the grant portion they can understand and appreciate uh, with or familiar with. So, after the Hoysalas, we have inscriptions of the Hoysalas, Sevunas, and they also used, apart from Sanskrit, there are a large number of Kannada inscriptions, both the Hoysala inscriptions as well as uh, the Yadavas of Devgiri, they also got many inscriptions in Kannada. And subsequently, in the medieval later period, we have Keladi and Mysore rulers also, they used a uh, large number of uh, inscriptions which are in Kannada. So, the, the private stone inscriptions of the age of medieval dynasties are majority they are written in Kannada, although some of them have a portion in Sanskrit. So, this is one of the inscriptions which is written in Kannada script, is just uh, highlighted here. Now, Telugu, and equally important is Telugu inscriptions. Now, let us look into the origin and uh, some of the inscriptions which are connected with the origin and development of this script. Like Kannada, Telugu appeared first in inscription about the end of the 6th century AD. The official charters of the early ruling families of the Telugu speaking area belonging to the 5th and the following centuries are written in Sanskrit. Grants written in Telugu appearing only from about the 9th century onwards. 
though there is a beginning is seen around the 6th century large number of telugu inscriptions started appearing from 9th century onwards and uh, as said mentioned above in the telugu speaking area they used uh, uh, sanskrit as also one of the main languages a number of stone inscriptions dating from 6th century are also written in telugu characters and language the earliest telugu inscription are those belonging to the telugu chodas of renadu which have been discovered in anantapur and kadapa district and assigned to a period between the 6th and 8th centuries ad some of the earliest among them are written in telugu are the kalamalla and eragodi padu inscription of erikala muttaraju dhananjaya who flourished about the close of the 6th and uh, the beginning of the 7th century ad so these are the earliest inscription of telugu language the copper plate grants of early chalukya kings of vengi or the eastern chalukyas are very important and they profusely use sanskrit other than that they also used telugu um, a few inscriptions like uh, akandam plates of uh, Vish- vishnuvardhana fourth and fifth are written partly in sanskrit and partly in telugu also the stone inscriptions of the chalukya age generally the chalukyas of vengi we find uh, mostly they are written in telugu characters with the you uh, adopted in large measure the stone inscriptions of the medieval telugu rulers speaking area the eastern gangas the chalukyas the chindas telugu chodas kakatiyas reddis gajapatis the vijayanagar kings the kutub shahis of golconda and others are generally written in telugu while the copper plate grants of some of these rulers known are written in sanskrit although often they contain a section in telugu especially in the description of the boundaries of the gift of land as i mentioned previously for the benefit of the donate donation the grantees you now they mentioned some portion in local language they can understand the significance and there they can understand the import of the record and now we are going to another important uh, language malayalam and tulu though comparatively compared to the telugu tamil and kannada this language appeared slightly later uh, in the almost in the medieval uh, period and uh, earlier as you know in the all the malayalam speaking area in kerala sanskrit was very popular and uh, uh, many inscriptions also written in those areas they are in uh, tamil characters and subsequently compared with other three major uh, dravidian languages malayalam is of uh, much less of epigraphic significance and tamil was exclusively the epigraphic language of the malayalam speaking area till the end of uh, 14th century ad and inscriptions in tamil were engraved in that region in the vatrayat alphabet but malayalam influence is noticed in a few records of the 13th century the first one is the suchindram inscription of kollam year 403 equivalent to 1228 to 29 ad is one of the earliest malayalam inscription to be seen in this region one of the earliest epigraphs in malayalam is the athinengal inscription dated 1452 ad is written in vatrayat characters as you know earlier when we dealt with the scripts we have said how from vatrayat the modern malayalam script originated so vatrayat forms one of the important uh, scripts from where the malayalam script originated and in the um, bordering karnataka and kerala we have another language which is prominent speak spoken the tulu language spoken in the south kerala district of mysore state they are written in malayalam alphabet and of course has no literature and alphabet of its own but it is also quite a popular language in karnataka spoken in some part southern uh, part of uh, uh, south kenra district of mysore state a few late medieval inscriptions written in tulu language and malayalam uh, characters also have been discovered so the paleography of these epigraphs is comparable to that of an inscription of kulashekar alwar 
who may have possibly be identified with the Alupa ruler Kulashekar Alupendra IV flourished in the first half of the 15th century AD. Now we are going to moving to the another segment of our discussion, Neo-Indian languages. So now we have spoken about the languages that were spoken in the southern part of India. Now we let us turn our attention and see how the other languages which are spoken are popular even to this day, modern languages like Marathi, Gujarati and so many things which too originated from the epigraphs. So it is called a Neo-Indo-Aryan language. It is observed that Neo-Indian oral is virtually an untouched field and lot of uh, epigraphical research work is needed. Many things have to be documented. There are many more inscriptions. Generally, when we report in the uh, uh, annual reports, large number of inscriptions that are found from 13th century to 16th century or even late period, we just brand it, name it as local dialects. But we have to really look into the real origin of them. But since they are quite different from Sanskrit, they are generally branded, they are generally given the appellation local dialect. But there are a large chunk of inscription reported from Madhya Pradesh, um, um, Gujarat, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar and many other parts of Northern India which are just given the nomenclature local dialect. But a uh, lot of research, linguistic point research has to be made just to see the strains of other languages visibly seen in these uh, local dialects. It is observed that among the Neo-Indian languages, Marathi appears first in epigraphic records. One of the earliest specimens of Marathi language is found in the Murmuri copper plate grant of 974 AD of the Chalukya prince Iruvabedanga Satyashraya. The earliest Marathi literary work is the Gyaneshwari, the popular name of the Bhavartha Deepika written by Jnana Deva. It's a commentary on the Gita, which was composed much later than some of the above records in 1296 AD. The Velapur stone inscriptions of 1300 AD are slightly later than the date of the composition of the said work. A number of epigraphs of the time of Adil Shahi sultans are written in Marathi. Among bilingual inscriptions written in Marathi and other language, mention may be made of a Kandarpur plate of Yadava king Jaitugi between 1191 to 1210 AD and the Lepakshi temple inscription of 6th century, both in Kannada and Marathi, uh, Kadapa, Telugu inscriptions. Even in Tanjavu temple, Brihadeshwara temple, there is a large number of uh, Marathi inscriptions and they have to be documented. And they too, Marathas, you know, they popularize this language and we have a number of inscriptions uh, recorded in uh, Tanjavur Brihadeshwara temple. And among the other dialect is Hindi and the local dialects which I earlier ref I referred to. There is a large chunk of inscriptions uh, written in local dialects and they have to be understood uh, in a better manner and uh, more research work has to be done even in the area of calligraphy when they are written in uh, local dialects. A number of Hindi inscriptions mostly on images and hero or sati stones were discovered in the former Gwalior state now merged with the Madhya Pradesh. The earliest of these records is a Jaina image that is the known first Hindi record, Jaina image from Shopur region and the date is tentatively it is read as Vikrama 1078 AD equivalent to 1022 AD. This is considered to be the earliest Hindi inscription. The Bonrasa inscription of uh, 1483 AD referred to the Sultan Gayasuddin of Malwa is also written in Persian and Hindi. We have a number of bilingual inscriptions which are written Arabic and Persian and for the benefit of it they are written in local dialects also and many a time in Sanskrit. So we have a large number of inscriptions uh, just to convey 
there are trilingual, bilingual, biscriptal, triscriptal inscriptions which they want to communicate. Even at times we have inscription also during the pre-colonial period even written in English so that the, the message, the whatever they want to say, they have tried to convey in different languages with the popular local popular people are aware. Among the Hindi records of the Gond rulers of Madhya Pradesh, reference may be made to a grant of 1550 AD of Dalpat Shah, son of Sangram Shah. The Damo inscription of the time of Muhammad Shah of Malwa is dated in 1512 AD. There are many other official and private records of late medieval period which are written in the or one of its dialects. Among the Hindi dialects, some late medieval copper plate grants issued by Hindu rulers of Kuman, Gadwal region are written in local dialects. A few, there are few copper plate grants of rulers of Sambalpur which are written in a dialect of Hindi. Late medieval prior records in various dialects and this language has been discovered in large numbers. And apart from this, a few Nepali inscriptions also have been so far published and a few short Punjabi and Hindi epigraphs were written in out of the country. This is recent Atishwag Baku and they have been documented and I had a great occasion to visit Baku and personally examine this uh, record and submitted a report to the government of India. And then another very important significant language which appear in the scenario is the Gujarati. There are a large number of uh, inscriptions. The language of a number of inscriptions discovered in Kathaywad, belonging to the second half of the 14th century is an admixture of Sanskrit and Gujarati, while from the middle of 15th century we have inscriptions in Gujarati language written in Nagari alphabet and slightly modified by the later Gujarati or Bodhiya script. Some of the earliest private records entirely written in Gujarati language so far discovered from Kathaywar are from Kambat and Kutiyana inscriptions of 1474 AD and the Gosa inscription of 1480 and the Kodu inscription of 1488 AD. Among the later inscriptions in the Gujarati language, mention may be made of Borsad, Lasundra, Junrad and Juna inscriptions. And uh, while looking at these things, a still a comprehensive study is required to bring out all the inscriptions which are recorded in either in Marathi or in Gujarati, uh, a detailed st study some a serious scholars should get involved to bring out many of the languages still inscriptions remain still undeciphered to be documented and published. And we have a few epigraph records in Kashmiri. India, India is such a vast country we have it is so rich in different languages and literature and Kashmiri language is not an exception to it. We have a large number of inscriptions. Some of there are some written in an admixture of Sanskrit and Kashmiri. There are charters issued by early rulers of Chamba or written in Sanskrit. And uh, a great monumental work uh, pro produced by Vogel and Chabra. They have documented all the earliest inscriptions, antiquities of Chamba state, where the first volume deals with the uh, copper plate charters and the second volume deals with the all the lithic inscriptions from different from different parts of the Himachal state. A large number of inscription of the official unofficial records published recently by B.C. Chavra antiquities of Chamba state are written. The bilingual charters of Chamba rulers generally begin and end in Sanskrit while middle portion consisting the deed is written in local dialect. As I told, most of the inscriptions, you know, they begin with a Sanskrit invocatory words and the end we have all the imprecatory words and specifically to give the donatory verses, you now they use the local language for the benefit of the donees. 
Another important language which we come across in the Eastern sector is the Orissan inscription. In Orissa, the influence of Orian language in inscriptions is written. Sandkins appear as early as the 10th century. Uh, records both the private and royal written, uh, written in entirely Oriya appears from 13th century onwards. A few official charters of the later members of the Eastern Ganga dynasties such as the Puri plates of Narsimha the fourth are written partly in Sanskrit and partly in Oriya. So you right now you will be seeing you know, how Sanskrit again and again occupied a very very prominent place irrespective of the region, the dynasty, it formed a part of integral part of the uh, epigraphical tradition. So all along the local language they try to uh, write most of the portions in uh, Sanskrit. So it amply proves the pan-Indian characters of the Sanskrit language and the many of the inscriptions written in Sanskrit language. Similar, we have is the case of Gajapati charters like uh, Veligalani copper plate of Kapileshwara, which has a section in Oriya, its other sections being written in Sanskrit and Telugu. But we have the same King's stone inscription together with a number of records of his successors in the Jagannatha temple as Puri, which are written in wholly in Orian language. Some official charters in, of the Gajapati kings and many issued by the later rulers of Orissa are also written entirely in Orissan language. Private inscriptions in Oriya belonging to the late medieval period are numerous. Now we are coming to the another language which is also equally important in the eastern sector, the Bengali language. In the Bengali speaking area, Sanskrit was more popular than the regional language for official purpose. It has been suggested that the lines 29 to 15 of Bhara Batera copper plate grant written in Silhet dialect of the Bengali language is very popular. But the language is really Sanskrit influenced by the local dialect as in the case of 13th century inscriptions of Bengal and also various other localities. The date of the epigraph has been read as Pandava 4328, Kali 4151 AD, the first of which is more probable. Official and private records of the medieval period such as the Tripura plate Maharani inscription of the reign of Vijaya Manikya and other inscriptions are there. Here I would like to strike a note that um, in the northeast many many inscriptions are there. For example, in Manipuri language itself, there are many many inscriptions are there. The present, uh, the local populace only know the modern Manipuri language. It's a very sad note that nobody knows the earlier, early Manipuri language. There are in many, several inscriptions are there which have been housed in the museums. But to understand, there are no resource persons or scholars. So there is a great need to understand. Even in Northeastern, there are many, many inscriptions. Apart from Sanskrit, there are regional language inscriptions are there. But a serious line of scholars should get into this and try to bring out the implications, the importance of many of the inscriptions which are written like Manipuri and other scripts and languages too. Epigraphic records written during the late medieval period are mostly in Sanskrit and only rarely in Bengali. Now coming to the other northeastern state is Assamese. They, you all know the Ahom kings of Assam originally issued copper plate charters in Ahom language but their Hinduization was more or less complete and they adopted Sanskrit and Assamese as their official languages. The charters of the later Ahom rulers are written partly in Sanskrit and partly in Assamese. They are dated in Shaka era. The coins of the early rulers have legends in Ahom language and alphabet, while the legends on the coins of the later kings are in Sanskrit. Assamese, Bengali characters exactly as their epigraphic records are. 
Among the Sanskrit Assamese copper plate grants, to no mention may be made of Shiva Simha and his queen Ambika. They made grant and Lakshmi Simha and Gauri Natha Simha, which are dated in different periods. Now we are coming to the another very, very important segment to understand the medieval, late medieval period history without the knowledge of uh, Indo-Muslim epigraphy, it is not possible. We will be so a brief remarks, studies made, points are made here to make you understand how Indo-Muslim epigraphy is also important to understand many of the later dynasties that ruled over in the medieval, late medieval period and there are a large number of inscriptions are there. As we have a branch of our Sanskrit and Dravidian inscriptions, Nagpur office has an office which is located at Nagpur to look into the Arabic and Persian inscriptions and they are documenting many of the inscriptions that are found throughout the length and breadth of the country and large number of uh, inscriptions have been copied and reported in various annual reports and it forms a very, very important segment to understand, to get an overall comprehensive view of the history of the medieval and later medieval period of Indian history. Indo-Muslim inscriptions in Arabic and Persian are available in India from the last 12th century onwards. The earliest epigraphs were found from Qutub, premises at Delhi and the Arhadin Ka Chopra at Ajmer and the tomb of Shah, Nevatul Shah, Shahid at Hansi. The number of records of the subsequent centuries is quite large. But it is in the 16th and 17th century, later inscriptions in Arabic and Persian are not so numerous. Punjab, Uttar Pradesh, Bengal, Bombay and Hyderabad are comparatively rich in Indo-Muslim inscriptions, while Tamil Nadu is uh, recorded very poor as far as the Arabic and Persian inscriptions are concerned. Among single places yielding large number of inscriptions, mention may be made of here Bijapur, Delhi, Ahmedabad, Fatehpur Sikri, Agra, Ajmer, Gulbarga, Hansi, Gaur, Bihar Sharif, Pandua and Malda places. Indo-Muslim inscriptions are generally found on mosques, tombs and similar religious buildings and give date of their construction or repairs often in, with the names of the reigning monarch and the builder and the repairer. There are some deeds of endowment made in favour of mosques and other religious institutions for their maintenance. Epi epitaphs sometimes appear on masks, inscriptions relating to masks on graves. Another kind of Indo-Muslim epitaphs are found regarding the construction, repairs of forts, bastions, fort walls, gateways, roads and granaries. There are also some administrative records containing orders or mandates proclaiming the abolition of taxes, prohibition of undesirable practices are relating to the amelioration of public grievances. A few inscriptions appear on stones indicating boundaries or slabs commemorating the visit of eminent personages and their halt at particular places. Some such stone slabs of Akbar's time, mostly carved by Mir Mohad, Maun Nambi and Bakr, commemorate the Mughal emperor's expedition to and conquest of Khandesh and the Deccan as well as his halts at various places in the course of his sojourney. Some inscriptions are also found on slabs attached to tanks, wells, schools, palaces, gardens, etc. Besides stone inscriptions, of course, there are also legends on coins. There are inscriptions on arms, sealing, seals, signets, vases, vessels, precious stones, a few inscriptions on guns and swords have also been published. The Muslim rulers did not generally engrave their records on copper plates, though a few copper plate inscriptions are also available. So the majority of Indo-Muslim inscriptions are written in Persian language. Many of them are in Arabic 
and some partly in Arabic and partly in Persian. There is another kind of bilingual record which are written in Arabic and Persian. On the one hand, Sanskrit or regional language like Marathi, Kannada or Telugu on the other. Inscription in more languages than the two are also known from the Persian inscriptions. The earliest Indo-Muslim inscriptions are in Arabic except the epigraph of Kotwal Islam Mosque at Delhi which is written in Arabic and Persian. It is dated in 1191-92 AD though it may have been set up some years later. Arabic continued to be the language of Indo-Muslim epigraphy till the last decades of the 13th century AD. But with the rise of the Khaljis, from about the beginning of 14th century, again, a few inscriptions of Arabic inscriptions are in prose, and earlier Persian inscriptions are also generally written in prose. The earliest dated inscription in Persian verse is the Hansi epigraph Alauddin Khalji. A few inscriptions, the Arabic inscriptions are in prose, uh, versified records of Arabic is the earliest of its kind in India. It also provides the earliest chronogram among Indo-Muslim inscriptions. Versified Persian inscriptions became more and more common at a later date. The majority of the inscriptions are not good literary compositions and exhibit gram grammatical inaccuracy and disregard for the rules of prosody. Thus, to sum up, we had um, understanding of the various scripts that prevailed in southern India as well as in northern India. It's an eye-opener for us. Earlier, perhaps we didn't know where our own languages, what we are speaking, where it's had origin. I think it has shown a pathway to understand, to go into the more details and understand the richness of each language, whether it let it be Tamil, Kannada, Telugu or anything, or even Indo-Muslim inscriptions. So what we now speak, many of the students doesn't know there is a history, there is a link. So epigraphy holds the mirror before us where the language started and how it developed and how many dynasties contributed immensely for the richness of the language that is amply shown in these inscriptions. And uh, for further details, you may look into the e-text and the many of the uh, supportive illustrations that have been given to understand the richness of our language. Thank you.